So um, yep. welcome everyone. Um, I'm Paul Okiomi. Um, I'm the AWS Cloud Captain for Bafemi Aolo University and um, really want to thank everyone for joining in and especially Ricardo for um, an amazing session we're, we're going to be having. So first I would like to talk about what the, what the club is all about and, and why you should join, why you should be interested. So um, AWS Cloud Clubs are yeah, student-led user groups, um, specifically focused on learning about how the We've cloud by AWS technologies. Um, and the goal is specifically to teach students about AWS and event. We're having, um, we'll be having sessions that are specific to different areas of AWS. Can you see me? Yeah, we can hear you. You can hear me. Okay. So, um, so in the coming weeks and coming months, we'll be talking about um, different various technologies that are specific to AWS. And um, we're going to be giving hands on experience um, and working through projects and doing all sorts of awesome stuff. So, um, thanks for following the cloud on cloud um, the cloud club on Meetup and subsequent meetings, you get notifications. So very quickly, I'd like to introduce Ricardo. So um, Ricardo is a principal advoc um, developer advocate at um, AWS. He works with builders, um, technology leaders, and enterprise executives to help them transform their businesses. Prior to joining AWS, Ricardo worked for one of the largest professional services firms. He, has over 20 years of experience leading open source, um, emerging technology and innovating program and innovation programs. He has been working with cloud technologies since 2008, such a long time. Okay, Ricardo is passionate about cloud um, innovation and open source, and he's excited about how cloud accelerates and amplifies customers' ability to innovate. So um, I want everyone to join me in welcoming Ricardo I know you can give a virtual clap wherever you are. Um, so welcome, Ricardo. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. My okay, I'm going to share mine. And whilst that screen is sharing, um, we've got uh, about half an hour left, I think. So this should be okay. Well, we, we should have enough time to go through this uh, um, presentation. Um, okay. But but the first of all, the the reason for this, okay, this session, um, you know, the fundamentals of cloud computer. Really, the idea here is, um, as you as students um, begin to, you know, take your journeys out into uh, work, it's really important to understand how to have the right conversations with people who may not understand cloud, okay, who may have a more traditional way of thinking about you know buying a server buying a computer and running everything on on that on those computers rather than using cloud services like aws okay so this um session really is intended to provide you with all the information you need to have a really good understanding of why we have cloud okay why did we end up where we ended up okay and therefore when you're ha when you have a conversation you'll be able to, um, uh, to to answer it very authoritatively. And when you think about it, you know, cloud is everywhere. Um, you know, it powers the applications and services that you all use every day, whether, you know, it's your online shopping, whether it's your favorite, you know, TV shows or TV channels, maybe you're a gamer, the games you play, um, you know, sitting behind all of those are cloud services, you know, that that, that make it happen. And of course, you know, maybe some of you have, have been curious as to how, you know, we ended up with cloud services. And so really kind of like my aim is you'll be able to walk away from this presentation with a really good understanding of why we have cloud, why cloud is important. And um, it will be useful for you as you go into work. And the kind of example that I, I'd like to give is imagine your, your, your first day at work. You know, you, you're, you, you're starting, you know, in your dream job, you're in the lift going into your desk 
and in the lift at the same time is the CEO of the company. And he turns to you and says, hello, how are you? And he, and he says, tell me what you do. And then you say, I work in cloud. I'm a cloud developer. I'm a cloud engineer. And he goes, oh, why do we need cloud? And so you have 30 seconds to explain to your CEO why cloud is important and how you're going to help your CEO you know, make uh, his business better. Right. And so this this information in this presentation, I hope, will give you everything you need to have a good answer. So when the CEO gets out of the lift, he turns to you and say, thank you very much. Carry on and, and keep making our business successful. OK, so that's the aim of this uh, talk. Now, I am I am recording it so uh, people uh, who might not be able to make the session today can can view it um, at their leisure. So to understand really the cloud and to understand where we are, we have to really go back to the past. And if we look you know, over 100 years ago, computers you know, were very, very big, but they actually weren't very capable. You needed you know, lots of people to run them uh, and um, uh, they did very specialist jobs. It's actually uh, ENIAC, you know, the first kind of Turing complete electronic machine didn't do much about it. It was like a, a very good calculator. But what happened, OK, through uh, science and innovation, we, we got microprocessors, microprocessors and microprocessors helped reduce the cost and complexity of computers. And uh, an early example of this was IB, the IBM 650, OK, which was one of the first mass produced computers of the world in the 1950s, with over 2000 of these um, actually being sold. And this kind of gave businesses a taste for computers. And so the computer vendors started creating kind of bigger computing platforms called mainframes. And these were pretty amazing machines. OK, uh, I had my, I had uh, the opportunity to to work with many of these early on in my career. And businesses really loved them because they were stable, they were durable, they were reliable. And, and so they very quickly allowed computing to, to become incorporated into lots of businesses. Um, and so what happened was over time, more and more businesses adopted these mainframes and they loved it so much. They started looking at ways of deploying more computers everywhere within the business. And it was that that really kick started the explosion of innovation as companies raced to create kind of these smaller desktop mainframes uh, and lots of different companies, DEC, HP, for example, here uh, created these kind of like desktop mainframes where you could run operating systems like a, like Unix and run all the similar applications you're running on the mainframes. It wasn't really until the 80s with um, Intel processors um, such as the 8088 that led to the kind of the explosion of personal computers with IBM creating the, 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 the PC um, helped obviously with the fact that uh, Microsoft created the operating system. And what was interesting here is IBM took off the shelf components to really lower the cost um, and make it so that PCs could be affordable by all companies. And actually what happened then over the next 30 to 40 years is constant innovation and uh, price reductions and performance, performance improvements uh, to get to where we are today. Now, it was around at that time, once we started getting computers on our desks, um, we then started to try connecting our computers together so that we could collaborate and share information and download files. Now, in those days, in the 80s uh, uh, and early 90s, the way we did that is through modems and bulletin boards. And this is an example of what they look like. You would connect on your computer to a modem. You would dial into a BBS and you would get effectively a menu system like this to get information, chat with people or download the latest drivers or files or software that you wanted. Now, Steve Jobs um, believed that everyone should have a computer. OK. Uh, and by that, what he meant was that everyone should be able to use a computer. So they should be really easy for everyone to use. And so obviously he created this whole generation of computers that were built effectively with the user in mind rather than a command line. It was using GUIs and mouse and that kind of thing. And so what happened very quickly is computers became the backbone of business. And they very quickly were in a situation where it was hard to imagine how you could run any business without one. Now, 
single computers were useful, but we then started to connect them together um, and then realized we could do some amazing things. And, you know, in the uh, early 90s and sort of like towards the end of the 90s, we were building networks to connect those individual machines to each other. And once we had these machines connected over these networks, we started developing software that would allow us to communicate with each other. And so things like email started um, uh, kind of being de developed and deployed within companies to help them better communicate with each other and also with other companies. And very quickly, we had lots of different ways of connecting computers. Um, uh, you know, it was actually very complex and it was very expensive. In fact, um, in the very early 90s, one of my first jobs was actually helping banks um, get different email systems to speak with each other. Uh, you know, at the time there were over a hundred different email systems and they all had their own different protocols and software, but all they wanted to do was email each other. And it wasn't easy to do that because they all had their own different standards. Uh, and so one of my first jobs was to build systems that would allow everyone to send emails to each other. And so what happened was this led over time to a period where standards uh, emerged that helped simplify that and make everything much more interoperable. And one standard um, where this was really, really uh, apparent was the birth of the internet um, and the internet becoming one of the standard ways on which we could connect information to share resources information. OK, and this is actually what Mosaic, the first web browser that I used, looked like. Um, and at the time, this was revolutionary. Um, you know, you would go into load the software and you would type in an IP address at the top um, and it would bring back, if you were lucky, a page. And that page had things you could click on. It had sometimes pictures and you could in, uh, you could navigate and access this information from across the world. And it was the first time that you could do this easily. Uh, one thing that was really important at this stage was the fact that open source was one of the key drivers that helped create this explosion of innovation and collaboration. And obviously, I'm a very passionate open source um, advocate. So, um, you know, open source is really key to the whole story that I'm telling you. Now, as we started using and depending on networks and, and, and uh, uh, connecting machines together, businesses um, started to invest in a new kind of computer called a server that was very specialized. It had lots of memory, CPU and storage. Um, and these um, servers could be sh shared resources that were used by businesses. And once businesses started buying these servers, they started actually writing their own applications and deploying them on these servers. But what happened was, is as they started buying more and more of these servers, they suddenly realized that they were using them very, very efficiently. Now, I'm kind of interested. This is the kind of a question I throw out. Um, what do you think the average utilization of these servers might have been back when businesses were running their own servers and using these things? So I'm going to open it up for guesses. Um, what do you think, you know, percentage wise, what do you think were the, was the average utilization? You can use the chat or you can open up your, your, your microphone. And you can uh, and give me your give give me your guess. No guesses. No one wants to be brave. Um, okay. I, I'm guessing. I'm guessing thirty percent. Not sure. Thirty percent. Um, okay. Thirty percent. Okay. Well, so that, that's that's the first guess. Um, I think. Many businesses wished and dreamed they could get 30 percent. Right. But the reality was that most of them were running about around five to 10 percent of utilization. And obviously that was a problem, right, because these businesses were paying for these resources that weren't being used. And so what happened was a virtualization um, is an, was an emerging open source technology that helped remove or help address that problem by allowing you to effectively virtualize those physical machines and combine many physical machines into one uh, machine, okay? And um, whilst these two that I'm sharing on the screen here are open source versions, very quickly proprietary um, virtualization in the form of VMware and ESX um, became very dominant um, and companies rapidly started deploying virtualization within their data centers 
in order to be more efficient. Now, the web, OK, wasn't just embraced by um, people. It was also embraced by businesses and customers. And very quickly, we had millions of people creating their own websites, using email, accessing web pages. And we then started to see businesses move to the Internet. And Amazon in 1994 was born in the Internet, uh, was one of these businesses. And this is like an early version of the Amazon uh, dot com uh, web page, as you can see, very basic compared to what it looks like today. Now, what happened um, from kind of like the late 90s to sort of early 2000s was IT began to grow. Um, and as it started to grow, um, companies started to look to ways to improve the efficiencies of how they could use um, technology. And so what this what happened was this led to the creation of this new role called the CIO, the Chief Information Officer. Uh, and this was really, really important, OK, because this was the first time that IT technology computers were present in the boardroom. And it was a really big signal um, to everyone that computers wasn't just something that you ran in the basement of your building, that it was something that was going to be absolutely important and critical to the business. OK, and so people started seeing it as uh, a shift from away from being a cost center to being a way and a source of competitive advantage. And that's a really important point to take away. It was a really big shift um, uh, that we saw in the kind of like middle, uh, middle to late 90s. And very quickly, what happened was businesses through the CIO started to hire lots of different people to do lots of different technology job technology jobs. Now, smaller companies, typically one person would do multiple versions of this. You know, you might have one person that do maybe three, four, maybe even sometimes six of these things. OK, but the role started becoming um, more well defined. And so what happened, OK, as businesses grew, their dependency on IT grew, they started getting bigger. So too did their data centers and the number of servers that they had. And very quickly, um, computers, uh, sorry, companies started having, uh, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of servers in their data centers. Now, while that was going on, uh, you know, there's something very important happened, um, which was um, Mark Benioff, who founded a company called Salesforce, coined the term software as a service. And this was really, um, uh, in response to a new emerging architecture pattern that changed how we built applications from being very kind of coupled tightly and what we call monolith to being more loosely coupled and then um, built around a bunch of services. And so this services uh, based uh, kind of architecture also then led to the birth of the API economy with 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 um, uh, RESTful APIs, which were developed in the early 2000s, being kind of the way that um, a lot of developers decided that 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 would be kind of like the, the best architecture pattern for interacting with your applications and services. And so again, as businesses started, you know, growing, what happened was that IT got big and complex and expensive. And so for many organizations, they did they thought that outsourcing it was going to be a way to solving that but when they outsourced it they very quickly found and i was very i was um involved in many outsourcing uh deals um in the uh kind of 2000s and whilst um it was a mechanism that companies found very useful um it did slow down because now what used to take maybe one day or one week would take maybe one month or even six months um and you know what was very clear before um, and was very easy to understand how you made a decision to make a change was now very, very um, unclear because you now involved multiple parties and there was contracts involved. And so it was very difficult really um, to get anything done. And so we got to a situation where really where IT now was becoming slow and not really working for the business. Now, against that backdrop, we had a number of different things happening. OK, we had computers getting faster uh, and cheaper. OK, thanks to Moore's law. We had virtualization, which was driving utilization up 
um, and being widely adopted. And we were getting to situations where 80, 90 percent um, of all um, uh, machines operating systems were virtualized. We had open source operating systems like Linux become start to dominate uh, those servers. Uh, and then we started to see the kind of the growth of global networking backbones and technologies that would allow you to very cleverly create global networks that would allow you to kind of create applications that you could serve uh, for your company, uh, your company users, wherever they were in the world. And as I've just mentioned, we saw this emergence of new software patterns around, um, you know, RESTful services um, and decoupled, um, you know, architectures. And so, you know, as Amazon itself grew as a business, we started to see some of those very same problems. And we were struggling to keep up with the pace of innovation um, uh, that our customers expected. And we wanted to deliver in order to delight our customers. So we asked ourselves, how can we make IT go faster? Now, how can we lower the cost of innovation? And it was with that in 2006, we launched um, AWS, um, which took a lot of those, those things I mentioned, open source, we're using Xen Hypervisor, virtualization and Linux. Um, it was API and services based. Um, you know, it, it was using the global network backbone. Uh, and effectively, um, we, we, we created a set of APIs, Amazon Web Services, that allow you to provision infrastructure. Um, uh, to, and at this time when we launched, it was storage and compute, all just through an API. Uh, and at the time, I was, a, I was a VMware architect. I was building um, infrastructure on VMware, um, which would typically take me between three and six months to build an infrastructure for my customers. And I went on to AWS in 2008, um, paid, uh, signed up with my credit card, um, and in 15 minutes, I had virtual infrastructure up and running in the cloud. And I just thought, wow, this is amazing. This is the future. And I basically, from that moment on, I, 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 I focused the, uh, my entire energies on learning cloud and um, becoming you know, a cloud advocate. But what is actually cloud? No, what is it? What is the definition of the cloud? So cloud computing is the on-demand delivery of IT resources over the internet with a pay-as-you-go pricing. Okay, and it's worth memorizing this. This is a very important definition. Okay, um, that is really important. You know, cloud computing allows and provides you a bunch of IT resources, compute, storage, and others over that network connection through an API. But it also does it through a pay as you go model, no long term contracts, no two or three year locked in price models. OK, you can use it for an hour and that you're and you're done. OK, and there are a number of different um, cloud delivery models. OK, so we have infrastructure as a service. We have platform as a service. We have software as a service. And using this very si si simple uh, diagram, you can think of infrastructure as a service as providing all the things you would typically do in your own data center, but through those API calls um, being managed by a cloud provider like AWS. Platform as service actually goes a bit higher. And actually what, they, what you start to do is you start to um, get managed services. So for example, if you'd like to use um, a, a database like Postgres, you can use a PaaS uh, Postgres like RDS that they take away all the complexity around managing the database and you just basically use it as, a, as, as an end user. And then software as a service are basically, that takes it all the way to the end where literally you're using it just as an application. So what was the impact that cloud had on the industry? So we've already seen how, you know, lots of, lots of uh, what happened was that cloud enabled lots of startups to now suddenly be able to build because they had access to IT services that they could use without having to invest heavily on all the infrastructure. And innovation exploded. And very quickly, we found that cloud started to change how we built stuff. You know, and cloud started allowing us to do stuff that we just really couldn't do before um, because of the nature and the scale that, that cloud um, uh, provided us. Um, 
And so, you know, at this point, you know, it's important that businesses started to think about, you know, what, you know, should we, should we be looking at cloud? And um, just check doing a time check. Okay, so we've got 15 minutes. There should be plenty of time. So um, businesses started asking themselves, okay, we should move to cloud maybe. Um, but in the early days, they were looking at it as a technology thing. Okay, oh, we have we have servers, we have data centers. Let's just move move them to the cloud. The reality is that um, the successful companies that have leveraged cloud treat this as a business transformation. Okay, they look at it not as a technology project, but they look at it from the point of view of how does the cloud help the business. And so I'm going to talk about five things. Okay, on, on specifically on how cloud. Um, you know, helps businesses. And again, thinking back to what I said earlier, you know, you're in the elevator of the of your dream job, you're talking to the CEO. And these are the five things that I think that your CEO is going to be most interested in hearing about. And, you know, if you say this message well, he's going to look at you and say, carry on, because I like what you're saying and I like what you're doing. So the first one is agility. Okay. Cloud allows you to be agile. Um, and there's a really very nice um, paper that explains that it's no longer a situation where big companies can dominate. It's now much more important that you can be agile, that you can be quick, and that you can react to the market. You know, custom, you, you can react to customer demand, customer changes in taste. Maybe you can react quicker to new um, legislation or, or regulation. And so being agile is super important. And cloud allows you to be agile because you're no longer locked into these big contracts you have with your data center providers or your software providers. And you can spin up and spin down resources as, as, as easily as you want to. The second one is innovation. Now, I'm hoping that some of you students will you know, become entrepreneurs and you already are probably thinking about, you know, your your million dollar unicorn idea. And in your head, you think this is this is the path my idea is going to take. Right. But the reality is different. The reality is that when we have an idea, typically we find that, OK, it, 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 it started well, but then it, it starts going downhill. And actually what happens is that as you iterate, what you find is that as you change from one idea to another idea, you start to get to this pattern whereby you're effectively iterating on idea to get to the right one. OK, and what we call product market market fit. Um, and this really is around, you know, how can you um, enable this? Because innovators love to, um, you know, experiment because experiments, they can confirm or reject those hypotheses, okay? And, and they can help you get to a uh, product market fit much more quickly. And so really what you're trying to do is lower the cost of innovation. And when I used to do innovation, I, uh, in my previous job, I was actually head of innovation at uh, a big one of the big four companies. And when we, when we wanted to innovate, it would take many months to provision the infrastructure we needed in order to, we, before we could start our experiments. Now, in 30 in 30 minutes, I've got all the infrastructure I need to begin my experiments. And if it doesn't work, I can I can basically um, uh, delete it all. And I've lost some time. I've lost some money, but it's a much quicker innovation process. So we've talked about agility. We've talked about innovation. The third one is elasticity. And again, going back to the virtualization and utilization, when you buy servers, OK, you buy the red line, you buy a certain capacity, but no business operates against that line of capacity businesses have an ebb and flow right they have business cycles you have busy periods and not so busy periods and so you have the blue line and the and the problem you have okay is that anything that's below okay the blue line the the, the red line okay is effectively a wasted capacity so if we look at this diagram here okay everything is shaded in red is actually um, waste. You're paying for it, but not using it. Now, sometimes companies, what they do is they think, well, okay, what's well, no, no problem. We'll just basically under resource everything. So we get to the bottom left, okay. And then when we suddenly get, you know, a new marketing campaign and we get new customers coming to our website, <laughs> they start basically getting bad experience. Maybe, the, maybe they get timeouts. Buffer. Sorry, can you 
can you go on mute please if uh because i'm getting a lot of noise thank you so 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 the issue is that when you go above the red line when you go above the capacity you start breaking your applications so you start then affecting your customers and your customers then start thinking i'm not going to that website it's too unreliable it always breaks and so that's not a good situation either and so what you really want okay is the ability to track your demand like this elasticity the green line and this is what cloud allows you to do okay it allows you to just provision infrastructure to support your usage and reduce your waste and if you reduce your waste you also reduce your cost so we talked about agility innovation elasticity the next one is global reach okay and as a business you know you know as you grow and as you want to go into new markets setting up regional offices is really hard uh, i i've done it a couple of times in my life um and it was really really hard you know but wouldn't it be great if in three or four clicks you could just provision infrastructure anywhere in the world and have your services available um uh, you know you know to, for, for your for your customers okay and i think that's that's one of the kind of the key things okay uh, that 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 um uh, you can do uh, with cloud and actually we end up having this kind of spectrum okay so we uh, on the left hand side you know we've got the actual aws regions but cloud now also provides capabilities through services that allow you to extend the reach of those regions into your data centers or into your branch offices or even into very remote in, in inhospitable locations where and we get to a situation where now cloud is everywhere um, including space right we've got ground station um, and you can effectively deploy applications and you can um, deploy those applications from uh, very close to your users all the way through to space okay and everywhere in between the other important thing okay is that um because aws uh you know uh, spends a lot of time and invests a lot of time in building these these, these uh, data centers we are very incentivized to make sure that they are env environmentally efficient and we've had lots of different uh research done um but typically customers when they use cloud they use less service and they use less resources um, and that's even before you you realize that actually when you're using aws services you're already improving the efficiency of, of your carbon footprint um, and so you know the not just the global reach but also the efficiency is a key reason why customers and businesses are going to cloud so we've had agility innovation elasticity and global region efficiency the last one is security and resilience okay now security has traditionally been hard and the reason for that is as companies build applications and they deploy them in their environments they're everywhere and they have this lack of visibility that combined with the fact that there's very low automation in these uh, in these environments but the business okay were faced with the choice of we want to move fast okay um, but moving fast means that we had to compromise on security. So, you know, it was a case of choosing one or the other. Well, the move to cloud actually now means that you can move fast and you can stay secure. And the reason is that when you move your applications or workloads to cloud, you have visibility that you never had before. OK, and this allows you then to use the native AWS services as well as services from AWS partners to track uh, uh, everything that goes on in your cloud environments. Another key thing is that when you run your own data centers, you have to do a lot of um, checks and audits to make sure that you effectively, or rather your customers have got assurance and trust that you know how to run IT. And these compliance checks, and they, they vary all over the world, they're very complex and they take months, sometimes years to complete. When you use cloud providers like AWS, these have these already done for you. So this is one thing that you don't have to do. And one key takeaway here is that um, when you're looking at um, uh, you know, cloud uh, security, we have this thing called the shared responsibility model, 
whereby AWS takes care of security of the cloud. So we protect the infrastructure, the servers, the, the buildings. But customers are still responsible for making sure they develop securely and use best practices. Because even if you build the, the best, most secure cloud, if you develop um, your software using very bad practices, OK, then people are still going to be able to access your applications and data. OK, so it's, it's important to you understand this shared responsibility model. So it's 2023. AWS has now been um, in, a, in, a, in an operation for over, over 15 years. We now have over 200 services that cover lots of different uh, areas, storage, compute, AI and ML, data analytics, robotics, you name it, it's there, okay? Um, Gartner has this, uh, um, what they call a magic quadrant, that tracks the cloud providers and AWS has been recognized as a leader in this space for many, many times. And, you know, that is reflected by the fact that we have so many customers who depend upon AWS for all um, their compute and their workloads. So cloud is the new normal. Um, I'm kind of very kind of keen to see what some of you will do uh, in the cloud. And, and that's kind of like the, um, the the end of the presentation, really. I did want to basically, and I think, Paul, you did kind of cover this. You know, we talked about very, very briefly about, you know, cloud clubs. OK, we are looking for people, you know, to to join to join this cloud club. Um, and so you can go to a directory um, where you can see um, people like Paul. who say, Paul, I hope you don't mind. I, I, I flagged you there on the presentation. But more than that, OK, we all, we've also got a no meetup. We've got a, We've got a we've got a cloud club meetup group, um, which you, we we're wanting people 